Welcome back everyone. I'm Nicola Canzano and this is my channel Parallel Fifths where we talk about all things historical improvisation and composition and I try to give you all some tips on how to uh, improve your playing and improvising and composing and, and understanding of, of Baroque music. Last time we discussed sequences which is a very important part of, of any Baroque musician's toolkit. And this time I'd like to circle back to a topic that I know is near and dear to many of my viewers' hearts, which is improvising fugues. This seems to be the ultimate goal of a lot of students who come to study with me, and a lot, uh, a lot, indeed a lot of students all over the world who are trying to learn to improvise and learn continuo and partimento and all these things. So I've made a couple videos about this already. In the previous videos, I went over things like order of entries, subject matter, meaning tonal versus real answers. We talked about a couple short exercises that we could do together. And I also made an addendum video where I cleared up uh, some bits of terminology and showed you an exercise that was suggested to me. This time I'd like to try a slightly different angle of attack, which is essentially to show you all some videos of myself improvising and then kind of debrief with you afterwards and let you know what I was thinking about before, during, uh, and of course after, and what things I could have done better. And then at the end we'll cap it off with some additional exercises that I can give you to bring you up to speed and at least begin to start improvising simple fugue expositions. All right, so I hope this is helpful. Let's see what happens. All right, so here I am back at the scene of the crime. Uh, it's funny, you can tell by the sigh I let out at the end of that video that I was pretty displeased with it at the, t at the time. Um, I, I had some you know, octaves. I'm sort of, the tenor entrance wasn't quite the subject and, and all these other things, but um, it really was, was not that bad at all. Uh, so rather than nitpick my own performance, though, it might be fun to, to go over these later and show you exactly where I, where I think I really messed up. Um, it's probably more helpful for you to, to, to talk about what, is, what I was thinking at the beginning and how you can um, at least start doing this yourself. So of course the most important thing to consider at first is the nature of the subject. We have to absolutely understand everything about our subject if we're going to improvise a fugue over it. Now this subject, like all good fugue subjects, is really just a decoration of a cadence pattern, and this is our saving grace. In fact, all Baroque themes are pretty much just decorations of a cadence pattern or a sequence or rarely some type of, of pedal point. So knowing that, we actually already know quite a bit about how, how to harmonize this. This subject is essentially just uh, a 51451. So if you know how to um, harmonize cadences and decorate cadences, which is one of the very first things that you learn um, when you study uh, historical improvisation, at least if your teacher is, is good, 
um, then you already have a pretty good understanding of what to do with this. This subject specifically starts on scale degree 5, which means that tonal answers are in play. So just a quick review, and, and uh, there's a detailed discussion of tonal and real answers in both of my previous videos on improvising fugues. Just a quick refresher is that. The tonal answer is, is something where in the subject, things that go 5-1-ish become 1-5-ish, as long as you can keep the shape of the subject the same. Now I had a fourth scale degree in here, which there's a whole technical discussion about why I'm still allowed to do this even though this repeated note causes problems in general, so if it had been... I actually couldn't answer that tonally because... Sounds kind of stupid <laughs> because of this repeated note. However, because I have... The second B flat sounds like it belongs to that. So the first note is sort of separate from what happens, so I'm allowed to do that. So now, the next thing I want to ask myself is whether I'm going to answer this from above or below. And now, fugue subjects that start on scale degree 5 um, generally can be answered uh, either above or below, because assuming, assuming that they end on something tonic-y. So if, something, if a fugue subject goes essentially from beginning to end, 5-ish to 1-ish, you will be able to answer it either above or below with no further consideration. And we can talk later about when you can't do that, maybe with... with um, Fugue subjects that start on scale degree one, you have to be careful. But this is the beauty of tonal answers, actually, is this flexibility. Because I, I always know that I'm going to start on this, this note, I'm going to end up in B-flat world. And so then, because the first note of my, uh, of my answers are in B-flat, I'm always in the right place. Uh, basically, this is the final note of the subject, and whether I put B-flat below or above, I, it's going to harmonize it just fine. Thirds and sixths, these are, these are our friends in two voices. Um, if, if, on the other hand, it ended on scale degree one, I mean, I'd still be okay, the octave's all right, but if, if, um, if the subject also started on scale degree one, right, then I actually couldn't answer it from below because the answer would, would become this. And you get this fourth, which is no good. All right, but we don't have that problem right now. We're starting on scale degree five. So if I choose to answer this from above, then I'm basically presented with the issue of, um, uh, well, let me say, we, we can use the fact that this is a cadence pattern to help us harmonize this. Right? And so if I know the sort of basic harmony that, um, that goes underneath this, then the problem becomes chiseling away at it so that I get things that are um, 30 and 60. So I basically try to reduce the base of this cadence pattern to something that is going to allow me to harmonize this mostly in thirds and sixths. So it helps a bit to simplify the subject. Is really... we could do All right remember I'm starting on B flat if I have an answer I'm starting on the tonic whereas we started 5 1 our answer is going to be 1 5 so here's the note we end on if we're starting if we're answering above I can use this this uh, this cadence pattern that we know and then chisel away at it to get something that sounds nice as an answer. And of course I can just decorate that, like I would decorate any other cadence pattern. Of course you have to get it to work out rhythmically. Um, I guess it did in that case. That's all that we're doing, right? So this is really your guiding principle for things that you're answering above, is find the cadence pattern. 
and play with the harmony a bit. Harmonize it a bunch of different ways. Uh, excuse me, that's not the subject. And have, have fun with it, you know? And then once you have a really good grasp of the harmony, even if you don't immediately recognize the cadence pattern, play with it a bit, and then use this to your advantage by chiseling away and coming up with a, a harmonization underneath that is mostly in thirds and sixths that supports that cadence pattern harmony. Now, if I'm answering it from below, like I did in the development section of, of the same view in, in minor, in fact, I answered it in four there, which we can talk about. Um, but that doesn't really, it's neither here nor there. I can answer from above or below either way. Um, if, you're answering, if you're answering from below, then the issue, instead of recognizing a cadence pattern and uh, picking away at it to come up with an equivalent harmonization in, in sparser voicing, the issue sort of becomes playing continuo in sparser voicing, right? So. Um, this is something that is usually somewhat easier for students. Um, often I, I have plenty of students who are competent at continuo, but, but harmonizing melodies is a little bit more difficult uh, for them. Uh, and in fact, the scholarship on this, which, which seems to, to lie um, you know, in the, the historical pedagogy in, in the art of uh, solfeggio, is, is, is brand new and just sort of coming out. Um, so if continuo is easier for you than harmonizing melodies, then you might want to answer these things from uh, below, in which case it just becomes a matter of playing continuo over your fugue subject, over your um, your your answer. In an increasing number of voices, going between one and five. One thing you can do is actually if you start from the top and you just go down, so your order of entries is S uh, A T B then you will always be entering from below, of course, and so you will always be just playing continuo with increasing number of voices, first in two parts. Then three. And finally four. And so if you're, if you're a good continuo player, then, uh, then this is a, a method that's good for practice because then you can sort of avoid this whole issue of trying to, to, um, to harmonize it from, from below as, as a melody. All right, so let's talk really briefly, just to finish off our discussion of, uh, of the exposition here, what, what I actually did with, uh, with the order of entries, which was um, alto, soprano, bass, and then ten or last, which is in the middle. Something I actually explicitly advise you don't do, but, but something I'm kind of enjoying more and more. Um, and I, I played something like this. Uh, uh, except I, I, that's what I meant to play. I, I actually messed it up slightly and played this instead. So that's not so big of a deal, but, but really the, the way to handle these um, in general is, is simply to practice them or to simply be aware of cadence patterns. So if, I, if I'm great at decorating cadence patterns, then I'm also aware of, of what happens in, uh, in inner voices um, and, and things that, that, are, that are kind of easy uh, to do with my fingers um, when, the, when the middle voices are moving. So knowing this cadence pattern, you know, I, I know certain things that work. And you, you can actually, um, you can listen to some of the, the logic behind these things and, and some simple exercises to get you going in my video about passing tones. Uh, I, I, I describe in detail a way to sort of build up um, skills about uh, adding uh, rhythm in your inner voices and, and things like that. And so, so, um, so inner voice entries become totally possible then with, with a more complete knowledge of, of uh, cadence patterns and, and schemata and, and uh, how to decorate them and, and how to pass notes uh, between, between the voices. But, but now let's talk about what, what I did in, in the development. Uh, and let me just correct myself immediately actually by, by saying uh, that actually I guess the exposition is not really over when all the 
the, the subjects uh, enter. So sorry, let me uh, correct myself by saying, let me talk about what happens after all the subjects enter. Um, a lot of people in theory class will learn that the fugue exposition is over when all the subjects enter, and this is a different type of exposition than I'm talking about. Um, if you want to um, know more about how I sort of think about, about structure in Baroque music, there's a whole video about it, um, basic structures in, in, uh, in, uh, in Baroque music or something to that effect. Um, and essentially by exposition, I mean sort of the first part um, after which, uh, you know, different, different things happen, maybe a different theme is introduced or, or um, but basically there's a big bow at the end of it, there's a big cadence, uh, and then we do other stuff. So uh, what happened between that and when I entered, or when all the voices entered is a sequence, right? I played something like... <laughs> Or something to that effect. Uh, and I actually messed it up with parallel octaves when I did it, which I just fixed. Um, I played, I think. Ah! So, pardon me. At least it wasn't parallel fifths. Although I think parallel octaves are probably worse, to be totally honest with you. Um, so the sequence that I chose to put after all of the, the um, all of the voices came in was the Romanesca. And it's always a good idea to put a sequence after all the, the voices have entered. You can put a sequence before all the voices have entered, and then you can uh, put, put subjects after that um, that haven't entered, or you can enter all the voices in sequence and then have another entrance, and, and that's something that I quite like to do. So all of this business of what to do after you have entered all of your voices, which is of course the technically difficult part, um, you are met with the creatively difficult part, and, and it helps to have some basic structures in your head. So let me just... Uh, let me show you all a, a really basic one that you can always do, and this works for things that aren't fugues. And I, I call this the simple exposition form or versetto form or whatever, and I'm sure theorists have a much better understanding of this in a much more generalized way with much better names, and I am not claiming to have invented a single thing. This is just something that I find helpful that I, I, I teach my students, and, um, and hopefully it's helpful for you. So uh, versetto form, uh, essentially, uh, you have an entrance in one, an entrance in five, an entrance in one, so, so three entrances. Sequence, all right? And then you have one more uh, cadence or entry or both that's sort of especially final. So as a skeleton, um, let's let's go to somewhere uh, besides B flat because my harpsichord is a little out of tune. You know, you, you know, it sounds something like this. So entries are basically just cadence patterns. So. So now if I decorate that, I can get something really nice. but I at least show you what I mean. And then actually, if you just undress that a little bit more, you, 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 have, a, you have a few. So I actually just accidentally played uh, the final bar in 5-4 there, which is actually uh, ended up not sounding that bad, basically because it was at the end. Uh, we should talk about that some other time, uh, about what happens at cadences rhythmically and, and um, with respect to the hypermeasure and all that. Uh, but for another time. Um, I al also think that for another time is a discussion of what happens in a, in a few development. So um, we sort of talked at length now about everything I did in the first part of that fugue, which is basically everything before the section minor. Um, 
And now I'd like to just talk through uh, another example and, and sort of solidify all of these um, all of these ideas. I'll, I'll just I'll just end with uh, the fact that the sequence I chose was the Romanesca, and the reasons that I, I chose the Romanesca I usually cho choose the Romanesca or the Circle of Fifths, um, and the reasons for that are are explained um, in my last video on on sequences. So I encourage you to to watch that, and I give some notes about where to insert this in the structure and everything. But so you've got um, now you've got a technique for answering from uh, below, which is to sort of play a simplified continuo. You've got a technique for answering from above, which is to play a simplified cadence pattern, assuming that your fugue subject uh, adheres to that, which it almost certainly does. And you've got uh, a technique for a basic structure that's going to work, even for figuration preludes and not fugues, which is, again, it's three entrances, one, five, one, um, a sequence, and then a final sounding cadence. Perhaps you stick another uh, entrance in there, perhaps you do a, a deception or, or something like that instead. Um, one That's one surefire way to make a cadence more final, by the way, is to, uh, is to basically deceive and then correct. So this turns into... Uh, Just to really hammer this home, I'm going to play you uh, the simplified version of this um, of this uh, simple exposition form one more time, and then we'll talk about something else. So here's the simple version of it. It's really easy. One more entrance in one, then a sequence. Let's do the same thing with a slightly different subject. And this subject was actually just given to me on the spot. Um, this is about a week ago, the Catskill Mountain Foundation hosted a conversation between um, a few different um, improvisers that are active uh, today. And um, at the end of it, John Mortensen, um, who is a, a very um, prominent improviser um, in, in our field, um, and I had a, had a conversation about a few subjects. And uh, I also took a subject from uh, the audience, which was the theme to the Pirates of the Caribbean. So this was uh, a risky thing. I, I played a prelude, and then I, I tried a fugue on it. And um, let me play this for you, and then we'll see what we can't glean, um, given the discussion that we just had. Well, let's give this a shot. So, it's Pirates like of the Caribbean. One, right? That one? I think so. Yeah.
All right, so that subject was a little tricky, actually. Let's talk about the answer first. So the fugue subject starts like this. And so actually, for a tonal answer, it should be answered like this, which I at least had the wherewithal to do that much. So the reason is that this is sort of one, this is uh, five one e And in fact, it's a problem because of this and not this. But, but the answer is the same either way. So here's the five e part. And here's the 1E e part. So remember that 5 1 becomes 1 5. So we'll become. So I at least knew how to answer it. <clears throat> and by the way, I played a prelude before this, not, not because I wanted to also play a prelude and do both, um, but because it gave me time to, to think about the fugue a bit. And also, if you play a prelude before a fugue, your fugue will pretty much always sound better. It'll just be a little bit more exciting. I mean, I'm sure you, you all know this from experience. So uh, now let's discuss how I actually harmonized this thing. All right, so now how do we actually harmonize this thing? Well, again, as before, it helps to just simplify it. Is really what that subject amounts to. So therefore, the answer would be... And so, just let's play the subject and the answer as the skeletons. If we're modal, or... And in fact, I did something like... Um, And this is a good way for us to get back to one. <clears throat> However, um, it was actually a mistake because now this voice is really just too low. I actually even had a little in my counter subject, which would be okay if this were two voices, but because I entered more, this, this um, entering voice, which is really sort of an alto e kind of function or a tenor, is really getting into the, the bass range when I do that. And if you watch carefully, actually, again, when I did the exposition of this fugue, you'll notice that my thumb almost went up here and for some reason I chickened out, but, um, but I really should have done that. And then I would be sort of in the right place, you know. Um, <clears throat> but instead, I, I stayed down here. So no big deal. Um, moving on, uh, I switched back and forth between these, and, and you'll notice that it wasn't quite strict. I mean, I kind of went between three and four voices, and um, and in the heat of battle, that that um, that sometimes happens. However, before I sat down, I knew that that circle of fifths would work with this subject, and I knew that it would work because it opens basically with with a fourth. So I knew I could do. So I had already sort of planned that that would work. <clears throat> and because I know how that sequence goes so well, uh, I knew that I would be able to decorate it however I wanted, you know. Etc. So you'll notice also that I didn't really have a clear A and a B. It was sort of one giant exposition, which is something that you can do. In general, I really recommend that you keep your improvisations short. This is very important because it, the longer you go on, basically, the higher the risk that you'll mess something up. And, and far worse, I think, than, um, than making a little mistake, you know, or clipping a note. I mean, none of that's a big deal. And in fact, research shows that 80 to 90% of people wouldn't notice, even your teachers or people that want you to fail. Um, so it's just, it's just not that big of a deal, little tiny mistakes. What is a big deal is if you sort of sound lost and like you're wandering or your time signature is sort of unclear for a minute. And in fact, that happened a couple times uh, in that fugue. Um, part of it is because the, the video uh, clipped and stuff. And so it, it didn't sound like it made sense when I, I promise it, it did in the room. Um, 
But you know, so, sometimes it happens, and you just, you have to just sort of get back on the horse, and, and more importantly, pretend that nothing went wrong. That's rule number one: is that you have to pretend that you're the greatest musician in the world when you sit down and improvise for people, and and at least seem like you are at ease, even if you are absolutely wanting to die inside, um, because you know it, it makes for a convincing performance. Um, this is how a lot of people who maybe aren't that great at improvising, I think, really get away with it: is that they're confident. So, um, so in any case, how did I actually handle the, the structure? Well, I kind of, rather than activate a different harmonic palette, which is what I would usually do in a B section, or, um, or introduce um, a different theme, which I can then recombine with things, which is another strategy I like, and we should talk about some other time, um, I kind of just activated different tessituras. So I kind of went up here, and I went down there, and I, inter I interspersed these things with basic Baroque cadence and sequence patterns. And I sort of also mixed this modal and tonal uh, nature of the subject, so sometimes I did. Or, and this was really more a result of me not really understanding how to handle this thing, which I, of course, don't do very often. Um, but in that case, you can always modify these things to, to make them fit things that you do know. And that's exactly what I had to do. So I had to sort of take what I knew about this, which was the fourthy stuff, this, this structure, which is quite tonal, and I know how to, to harmonize, uh, you know, no big deal. Um, and, and do what I can with it. <clears throat> as far as what happens after the initial sequence, like I said, I'm essentially just trading between subject entry complexes, where I have an entrance or two or three, uh, always trading between one and five, or perhaps four if you get a little bit later, cadences, <clears throat> and... Um, sequences. And then when I felt like I've played enough, uh, I decided to end it. And uh, I really probably should have um, done a little ritardando, but I, I um, sort of plowed through it um, and signaled that I was done with this Picardy third. And everybody knew it was over. Um, what I probably could have done in retrospect is have a pedal that kind of does this. And uh, that's a, always a good way to signal that you're done. The issue is just how do you, uh, you know, fit that in, right? Um, I guess I would probably, a, a good way to do it is to kind of just play your subject in four. So I might have, so let's say I, I ended, uh, you know. Yeah, that's not quite the subject, but people would get people would get the idea. So, um, so the main takeaway here <clears throat> is is to use the same techniques as before. Simplify your subject. Try it as continuo. Try it. Um, <clears throat> try it as a cadence pattern. Um, and uh, and use what you know and insert it in the, some structure that you know. Uh, and, uh, and in this case, um, I used a sort of more general structure where I traded between sequences, cadences, and entry complexes. And there's a more general treatment of how these things um, play with each other in, in, the, uh, in the basic structures video that I discussed earlier. All right, so I, I hope these discussions were at least mildly helpful, and, um, and, and you, can, you guys can always contact me with, uh, with questions and stuff if it's not. So I'm um, going to wave to you goodbye now, um, and hopefully I'll see you next time. Okay, so that's all for now. Thank you so much for watching. As always, if you're interested in lessons or just to have some questions for me, you can always email me at the address below. And I hope to see you next time. Thanks so much.